So hello, happy Friday, and thank you for joining me today. It is July the 17th. This is Friday Super Heated Friday, I'm going to call it, because we're in a heat wave everywhere. What's the temperature in here? 92 degrees. That's right. It's keeping company with the bees over here. And uh, this is question and answer video number 69. And uh, my name is Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So... The questions that we're answering today were submitted during the week, and if you want to know how to submit your own questions, I'm glad you're here, because you can write them down in the comment section down below. If you want to see what we're going to talk about relevant to backyard small-scale beekeeping, you can look down in the video description below and uh, see a line item by line item, the questions that we're going to discuss today. And uh, you can also see some links in there uh, for your convenience, so you can find the things that we talk about that are relevant. If you don't want to write something in the comment section down below, please follow the link to the Fred's Fine Fowl Facebook page, or please follow the link to my main website, which is fredsfinefowl.com, and you can fill out a form there. That link will also be down in the video description. Now, if you're having troubles keeping track of all the videos that you've watched and you don't want to be repeating them, go ahead and click the like button down in the right-hand corner there, and that will, you know, hey, I already saw that. So, uh, as I already mentioned, we're in a heat wave. It's going to continue right through the weekend. Severe thunderstorms coming. It's super hot right now. Wait, let me get some coffee. Okay, that helps. And of course, we are restricted once again, my entire state. No gatherings larger than 25 people. But you know, for a lot of beekeepers, it doesn't change a darn thing because beekeeping in uh, a lot of circumstances are really just about the beekeeper and the bees. And you are solitary in what you do, unless you do things like I do, which is reach out to educate people about beekeeping and share your experiences. So I'm glad you're here. We're going to jump right into it. First question comes from Ryan McDonough, Portland, Oregon. So it's probably a little cooler over there in Portland. Anyway, what's the verdict on the slatted racks? Do you love them? Do you hate them? Do they reduce swarming? They're better overwintering or more complete use of the lower ends of the brood frame. So you're a new beekeeper. What the heck is a slatted rack? Because you know what? When you buy a bee kit and you're setting it up, there's a bottom board, there's a brood box, there's an entrance reducer, there's a super, there's an inner cover, there's an outer cover. Where's a slatted rack? Just happen to have one right here. This is a slatted rack. You might not have seen one because not very many people use them. Where does it go? Well, first there's your bottom board. Then this sits on top of the bottom board and see this heavy wooden section on the front that blocks extreme winds in the wintertime. And it also keeps your brood area, which is above it, somewhat darker because the light comes in through your entrance on your landing board. The claims are that this will reduce bearding of your bees, which is when your bees gather on the outside of the hive because it's hot inside, or they've just brought in a pile of nectar, and uh, they're spreading that nectar out, they're dehydrating it, so the foraging group gets kicked out. They have to be on the outside, because guess what? First of all, they slow the air movement through the hive, so you need to get out of the way. And they also impede some of the dehydration that goes on when the nectar is being dried out and converted into honey. It's not just a matter of drying out, of course. They contribute their own enzymes to it and everything else, which is what makes it honey and what makes it awesome. But the slatted rack, has it worked? Well, it works for me because I use it for a lot of things that maybe it wasn't intended to do. I drill a quarter inch hole in the back of it so I can put my ProVap 110 oxalic acid vaporizer through the back. And I use a quarter 20 threaded placeholder in there so it has a utility uh, purpose. Why on earth would I do that? Well, it lets you do oxalic acid vaporization, whether you do it through the main entrance or through the bag with a drilled hole, as I do. It keeps your hot iron from touching the bottoms of your frames, which are the brood frames, and we don't want to catch anything on fire down there. We also don't want to melt the wax on the bottom of your frames with your oxalic acid iron. And also sometimes the bees come down and because there's a foreign object in the hive, they get on it and because it's hot, it kills them. So when you pull it out after you've done your treatment, there's a pile of dead bees on it that is all eliminated with a slatted rack. So there's a plus right there. Did they cause better wintering? 50% of my colonies, we went through winter with 15 colonies. We lost one. 
Uh, half of them had slatted rights, half of them did not. There was no difference. So there's that. Now, do they all beard with or without slatted racks on the bottom? Because the, the thinking is it creates more airspace underneath there. So those foragers, instead of collecting on the outside and bearding underneath your landing board, bearding is just a collection of bees that are hanging out outside and they're clinging to the hive and they're not doing anything. Is that reduced when you have a slatted rack which increases the interior space? It has not been my experience that it's eliminated. It might be reduced a little bit. But a lot of my bees come out on the face of the hive where it's the coolest anyway, because there is also a hive visor on my hives, which is just a shade that screws onto the front of your hives, no matter what size you have. And the bees collect up under that. They stay in the shade. Bees are no fools when it comes to finding a place to be. See what I did right there. Anyway, uh, the slatted right did not eliminate bearding. So there's that, two strikes. Now the other thing was, because it creates that dark area at the bottom, on the brood frames, sometimes when you get to the bottom of a frame, let me get my musical instrument out here that I was playing at the beginning. This is a medium frame for a medium super. But let's say it's a deep brood frame. So what happens is, you know, they make their comb along the sides and then they kind of cut away down here or eventually they might run it all the way to the bottom bar especially when it's at the bottom near the entrance, uh, the queen tends to not lay her eggs all the way down. So, did that change with the slatted racks in place? Did they make use of the space in the frames all the way down in the colonies with slatted racks as compared to those without them? And remember, it's because it makes it darker at the entrance because of that lead board. It also cuts down on drafting so the bees have better control over the air going in and out. That's very interesting too, because um, I'm gonna try not to get sidetracked too badly here. But uh, in wild colonies in trees, sometimes the interior space where your frames are and the entry point is the thickness of the tree. It can be six inches or more. So, and in general, that hive entrance, even though the colony inside is huge, it's about an inch, an inch and a half in diameter, but it's, you know, oval, or it might even be a crack or something like that. So in the wild, they don't uh, have the entrance immediately adjacent to their comb. Now their brood is generally down low near where the entrance is, but even in the wild colonies, they don't run their comb all the way down to the bottom. So I have to say, yes, it did not have an impact on how far down the queen laid her eggs. Sorry. So what else did it do that it was supposed to do that was amazing? It adds another piece of equipment to your hives. It adds another piece of gear. It adds another joint. So now instead of just the bottom board and then the brood box, we have another joint because there's one under the ladder rack, one over it. Bees seal it up just fine. So my vote is for marginal improvement of bearding, barely. The other thing is the utility aspect. If you're using oxalic acid vaporization, things like that, it also may cut down on robbing because the robbers can't immediately get in and jet right up the front and get right into your frames because there's a barrier there, so they have to go further in. Wasps, for example, if they're robbing your hive, which usually the robbers are the most effective robbers, are other honeybees. They go right in there. But uh, robbers don't like to follow little twists and turns on their way in and back out. They like to get straight in and straight out. So by creating an additional barrier, slats that they have to go through, another thing that they have to go around, I'm trying to think if the recent robbing that I had, if they actually had um, a slatted rack, no. So, now one of them did have a slatted rack, so maybe it doesn't stop robbing either. I'm just talking through my hat at this point. So what's the verdict? Do I love them? Do I hate them? Don't love them, but I appreciate them. And I'm going to continue to use them. And eventually, all of my hives will have one. Because as I'm reconfiguring the hive, as I'm swapping out equipment, I'm going to be adding slatted rags to all of them, eventually. Just because, remember, what do I use it for? Exalic acid vaporization. So we're moving on. Eddie Merrick. I was curious, I noticed some of your hives have two deep, one medium, and then the flow super. Is that because you wanted to control a swarm, have an increased population, 
Or do you want the option to harvest comb honey? In a previous video, you made mention that two deeps would be enough for the bees to survive colder climate winters. And that's what I get uh, referenced to a lot is because of where I live, which is, by the way, in the northeastern United States, in the state of Pennsylvania, in an area called the Snow Belt. It gets plenty cold and we get long winters, five to six months of really good winter, and uh, heavy snowfall, sometimes over 100 inches in a year. So one year we set a record for snowfall in my area. Anyway, uh, so when we get our hives through winter and this individual, Eddie, is asking about a flow hive in particular, my rules are always the same. I did a little drawing that I hope shows up here and I'm sorry I did it in red. I should have done a more contrasting color. As a minimum, every colony that we set up, we start out with a deep box and that doesn't matter if it's an eight frame or a 10 frame it's a deep. Next, you want to at least have a minimum, a medium super on. This is primarily for the brood, for the baby bees, and this one up here will be a combination of bees and honey stores. And I always tell people, leave your bottom two boxes completely alone. Don't take any resources, don't take honey or anything else there. Now, if they're strong enough and they save all their resources and you look in there and they fill this top box, I have a video coming up this week that's going to show you what that looks like. If they fill this top box, then you can add a super. A super is an extra. That's where the honey is going to be stored that the keeper gets to take off. If they fill that, you add another one. They get to take that off even more. If it's a flow hive, the flow super, you only need one of them. And then you would pull out individual, drain individual frames from your flow super to keep up with that nectar flow, which sometimes happens so fast. This year, we've drawn off honey already from one of our flow hives. There's another one almost there. And uh, we took out over two gallons of honey from a seven frame flow hive too. And it's full again, and we're not even in the nectar flow. So that really comes down to the number of bees in the colony. Let's move on. Your other option is two deep boxes, and there's an advantage to that. Two deep boxes, if you're physically strong enough to lift those boxes, then these two will remain for your bees. So if that's an eight frame, you'll have 16 frames of honey, nectar, pollen, brood, all the resources. This is what brood looks like. This is what capped brood looks like. That's what honey looks like up there. Down here, they're actually doing a combination of brood and honey, so they haven't drawn all the way down. The entrance to this thing is down in the bottom. But this is what two deeps would look like, see? And they've actually run it right up to the edge of that honey. So if you had two deeps, that would get you through a severe winter. Normal size colony. And again, you don't touch those. What's the advantage of two deeps? Well, you got to be fit to lift them, so it's a good workout program. But the other thing is, I drew little swapping arrows here because in the spring, all of your bees are going to be up in the very top because they will have used up their resources as they migrate up and they'll start their spring brood in this top box. So what's down here in the spring? Your deep box that's empty, but usually you'll find a couple of frames on the outer sides here that still have honey in them because the bees migrated up through the middle and they've used this and they kept this compartment warm and they started their brood and then as that develops, they will migrate back down through summer or you can pull this box, swap it, make it the top box, take the top box, swap it, make it the bottom box in spring. And that's called under supering, swapping boxes, and that makes sure that they make full use of the comb. That works better than what the previous question was about with the slatted rack. Does that cause the queen to use all of the spaces, all of the cells, all the way down to the bottom? The slatted rack didn't but rotating your bottom boxes will definitely cause the queen and your bees to use all of the cells and also to draw the comb out all the way down because at one point it was the upper box, now it's the lower box. So played a trick on the bees and got them to do that. So that's it, 50 to 100 pounds of honey. I know it's a broad span, you know, it's 50 or 100 pounds of extra honey to get them through winter. Our goal is always not to have to feed the bees and uh, that works out. So where I live, actually, even though we have the heavy snowfall, we don't always have um, extreme cold. Like I've never seen a minus 30, minus 40. Some of the viewers write in minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and uh, that's severe cold. I don't, I don't get that here. I'm sure some antifreeze can't handle that. But anyway, uh, and also I will say this, even though it wasn't asked this time, I'm frequently asked, do you insulate your hives? What do you do to prepare them for winter? How do you protect them from the elements? Well, where I live, again, it doesn't get that cold. You know, if we get days in the teens, uh, then that's really cold for us. But it usually pops right back up and it's in the high 20s, low 30s, things like that. So I do not insulate them, but do I believe in insulation? Absolutely. If you live in a colder climate than this, if you're moving north and you're getting those minus 20, minus 30, you better seriously look at people that insulate their hives and the practices of doing that. Uh, right now, the closest thing I have to an insulated hive is my horizontal hive, which is inch and a half thick lumber, which so the lumber is the insulation. But uh, that will get your bees through winter. Here's the next one from Jeff McDonald. Just moved here, Central Texas, from California, and I'm planning to get a couple, you know, Texas and California, two states, they're in huge trouble right now because of COVID-19. Anyway, sorry. Uh, just moved here to Central Texas from California, and I'm planning to get a couple of hives in early 2022. I know you're a fan of Bee Weaver, and since they are only 150 miles away, I was strongly leaning towards their genetics, but was wondering about your updated thoughts on the Saskatrass bees. So you're a new backyard beekeeper, and you're watching this video, and you're thinking, what the heck is he talking about? Bee Weaver, Saskatrass bees. First of all, uh, the Bee Weaver bees, which come out of Texas, when you look at uh, the genetics of bees and queens and things like that on all the charts that are put out by all the universities and all the studies that are going on, you never see bee weaver bees on there. So they are kind of standing alone. And I do recommend bee weaver bees out of Texas because more than 10 years ago, when I was looking for varroa resistant hygienic bees, uh, the bee weaver family came up because what they had done through the years is their long-standing uh, bee breeding family and a honey family and so on. They do a lot of meat and products like that as well. Anyway, uh, they decided not to continue to treat their bees. They decided that was not sustainable and that in the long run they would do much better to allow bees that weren't making it on their own to simply die off. And those that survived, they would breed from those. And they did that generation after generation after generation. So they ended up with bees that were not treated, that were surviving. And that's why it sounded like a good idea to me. Be a natural beekeeper and uh, do everything you can to protect your bees, provide them with good resources and everything else, a good environment and so on. And then just hope that they make it on their own without any Varroa treatment in, you know, in particular, because Varroa, is the number one thing that wipes out beehives around the world where the Varroa destructor might exist. That's why I use uh, Bee Weaver bees primarily, but now, last year, we jumped on board with the Saskatrass bees. Why did I do that? Texas is a hot climate. I live in the Northeast, and the Saskatrass bees were developed in Saskatchewan, Canada, and then they set up a breeding deal with uh, the Oliverez family in California where Jeff McDonald just left, and uh, they have their breeding program there, and they're the only authorized breeders of the Saskatraz line here in the United States. So if somebody else is selling you Saskatraz bees, they may not be authorized to sell those genetics. So we buy those through Man Lake, and they're pricey. We're talking 250 bucks, something like that, for a package. And a package, again, because you're new, you may not know, what's a package of bees? Well, they take a mated queen, they put her in a little cage, might look like this. Queen bee comes in here with some workers, they put that in an envelope, they mail it to you. Okay. And uh, they put it in a package of worker bees that may not even be related to that queen. And they sell them by the pound. Three pound package, five pound package. I generally buy three pound packages myself. They'll ship that through the United States Postal Service, wherever you live in another country. I don't know what the uh, methods are for shipping bees around. But the other thing is, instead of buying that whole package, you can catch a swarm in spring. If you have all brand new equipment, that might not be a great idea. Swarms are always a gamble. But if you catch swarms in spring, you've got bees that have survived through your winter and are acclimated to your environment, but you're gonna bring in uh, a swarm that has a queen in it, she's already laying and everything else. But if your heart is set on a known line of bees, you can collect a swarm, you can remove the queen from the swarm, why you do that, I don't know, because they might be awesome. 
But if you want to know the genetics, then you fly in a queen and you replace that queen that you removed three days after you've removed her. And so for $51, the Weaver family mails them priority mail, the queen. Put her in there. That's what's in here. These are, they didn't ship me all these bees, see? So what I did was I just pulled a bunch of brood frames out of other hives that I have without a queen, put them in here, and then I open an inch and a half hole on the side here. And after they were queenless for three days, because remember, it's just brood that I pulled out of another hive that was doing really well. And that's even why I had to contour. I don't know if you can see the edges here. I had to contour it so it would fit through that round hole. And I put the queen in there and then I let them pull her out. So that's how this became a bee weaver colony just by buying the queen in. So let's make this comparison. If you're in Texas, now the Saskatraz are cold climate bees. Cold climate bees can function in hot climates as well. Hot climate bees do not function so well in cold climates, so it doesn't go both ways. In my opinion, having worked with both, if I were living in Texas, central Texas, I would use the bee weaver bees. In fact, if I were in any of the southern states, I would go with bee weaver bees over the Saskatchewan bees. Now, if I'm in a northern state, they really perform shoulder to shoulder. The Saskatchewan bees in the north tend to glean more nectar from the environment than the Saskatchewan bees do. Although, Saskatchewan bees build up extremely fast and on occasion may require treatment. Let's talk about the temperament between the two. We want to work with bees that are easy going and laid back and everything else. I can't tell the difference uh, when I open a Saskatraz colony or a bee weaver colony and I work those bees and and for those of you who watch what I do I spray them with one to one sugar syrup and uh, three teaspoons of honeybee healthy in there which is an essential oil mix per quart and uh, I spritz that instead of smoke and both of those lines of bees perform the same they're totally calm they're so laid back there's always one guard bee that tries to sting my face. I don't know what that's about. The rest of them are totally cool. There's one always that comes to get me. So, which is why I frequently wear veils now, no matter what I'm doing. But between the two, in Texas, I know I took a long way around the barn on that one, but for Jeff, Saskatraz marginally wins over, I mean, Bee Weaver marginally wins over Saskatraz bees in a southern state where it's going to be arid and where the, the seasons are warm longer than they are colder up here. Okay, Charlene Knoll. Well, last Saturday, the man behind me was having his grass mowed when the mower caught on fire. Had to call the fire department, burnt the back pallet fencing of my yard. My bees were flying into the flames. Now it's still just as hot temp, 84 degrees. Uh, now, I don't have any bees bearding on the front of my hives. Burnt fence is about 15 feet from my hives. So, what's going on? No more bearding. But this leads me to a lot of things. And so I wanted to talk about this today because this is interesting. And I asked Charlene, who actually wrote this on Facebook. So, what do bees do when you're smoking them? Why do people smoke the bees? Uh, you will hear people tell you, because you're beginning beekeepers, generally, or you're small-scale backyard beekeepers, just looking for little tidbits of knowledge that might be something you didn't know before. Uh, people will say that we're smoking the bees because they're making preparations to evacuate the hive when they smell smoke. So they start loading up on their honey, and then they're going to fly out if the hive burned, if it was a forest fire. And... Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been told that exact same thing, but this, what I'm about to tell you, ties in with what Charlene's bees are doing. What do they do? They were flying through the flames. They stayed in the hives. There's an adjacent fire. I'm only assuming there's a lot of smoke from the fire because 15 feet away, the fence was burning. 15 feet is not that far. A lot of heat can be generated there. I don't consider the 84 degree temperatures to be very high. What's the temperature inside a beehive? If it's 84 degrees outside, they're still heating the inside of the hive. Why are they doing that? Because there's brood here. 
See, we're people, so being humans, we tend to transfer our own sense of comfort and well-being onto animals like honeybees. And uh, the honeybees need that warmth. If it's only 84, they're actually generating heat in there to keep their brood at 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit, so they're actually still warming up. But the discussion here is about the bee behavior. They went inside. What do bees really do when they smell smoke? They contract, they seek deep shelter. They're really not making preparations to fly out. That's speculative, isn't it? Why would the bees fly out and abandon their colony when there's a fire? A fire showed up, smoke is being puffed in. They're gonna take on a bunch of honey, which they do, but they also concentrate themselves down in the brood area and around the brood. And so these uh, beekeepers that get in there with their smokers, I use them. I mean, there are times when you use a smoker. I'm not going to squirt uh, sugar syrup on them when it's cold outside, when it's 55 degrees. I only do it on nice hot days. But uh, if you puff smoke in there and you keep puffing smoke, the bees, people use it to move the bees away from areas and to get the guard bees to back away. Guard bees come out there looking at you, the little heads are looking right at you, and a couple of them take off. You give them a few puffs of smoke, they turn away, and they move back down inside. They're not making preparations to leave. They're consolidating themselves away from the smoke and they're going to fan their wings and they're going to keep the smoke and everything away from the valuable brood. And what else are they going to be keeping the smoke away from? This is why they freak out when you puff the smoke in there and you hear them whirr because all of their bees, all of them start flapping their wings and they're trying to get the smoke away from the queen and from the brood. Now, let's say it's true that they're trying to take on a bunch of nectar and they're going to take off and abandon the hive. Those bees would 100% be doomed. Why? The queen can't fly. The queen is in the middle of laying eggs. The queen is gravid. She has a heavy abdomen. Queens cannot just swarm out and depart the colony on a whim. They have to be exercised. They have to be cut down on their feed. And the nurse bees do that to them in preparation for swarming, which takes many days. So the idea that a fire could show up, that they'd smell smoke, that they would habitually, instinctively fill up on nectar and fly away from their colony would result in the total destruction of colonies that fly out. They have no means of reproduction when they leave. They have no, obviously when they bivouac somewhere and they pick a new place to live, Who's going to lay the eggs for them? The queen didn't make it. She's too heavy. She would have landed right on the ground. If they all flew out together, she would have been right on the ground and burned to death by the fire. So this flies in the face of the thinking that bees are making preparations to depart the colony when they smell smoke. They're really not. You're, they're, they're clustering down and they're condensing themselves down and uh, making preparations to survive it rather than abandon. So if they were in a tree somewhere and they, they did that and they shielded themselves and they filled their bodies with uh, honey so they could do that for a long time, just in case it all melts and creates a huge mess in there, their chances of survival are much better to remain in place and stay inside that log because a lot of forest fires pass over. They don't stay and burn to total destruction every single thing in their path. If they do, everything's done anyway. But their chances of survival between departing the colony and remaining in place are greater if they remain in place. What do you think of that? What are your opinions on that down below? Fred, where did you come up with that, you know, baloney of a story about bees staying in place? Oh, good. Um, thank you for asking. I was reading this book. Thomas Seeley. Dr. Seeley knows stuff about bees. Been doing it for a long time. The title of this book is The Lives of Bees, The Untold Story of the Honeybee in the Wild. And when I was reading this recently, over this past weekend, that's when I came across the excerpt about what do bees really do when you smoke them. So we have Dr. Seeley to thank for that. But when I read it, it makes perfect sense to me. So now we have another way of looking at what the bees are doing and what their behavior is, what the response to smoke is and why. They're actually condensing, trying to survive. So I think her bees are okay. I think that Charlene's bees not bearding just means that they're in recovery, they're inside, they're protecting their queen. 85 degrees, 84 degrees outside, not bad at all. So I think they're good to go. And 
I hope that she keeps us all updated and that we'll know what they're going to do later. Next comes from Joy Boschler. Uh, I destroyed, let's see. Hi, Frederick. I live in Brush Prairie, Washington. Cool sounding place. This is my first beehive. I did an inspection and there is a lot of honey. I'm not sure if I should take any. Also, I found a couple of queen cups. Terminology is important here. We're going to talk about it. With queens inside. Two super seizure cups. I destroyed all of them. I noticed there was not a lot of brood. Should I be worried? Okay, and I'm so glad that Joy wrote in because, yes, you should be worried. And this is a teaching moment because what were the indications here? First of all, I did an inspection. There was a lot of honey. I'm not sure if I should take any. At this point, I would not because that colony is in transition. How do we know they're in transition? I found a couple of queen cups with queens inside. So these two terms don't match each other. Queen cups, you'll find them on the edges of frames of brood generally, right on the bottom of the frames. Thank goodness all my observation high bees here are not doing any queen cup production. A queen cup by itself, it looks like the cap of an acorn by itself there, and it's empty. That's a queen cup. That's so that if down the road they need to replace their queen, they've got a cup started that later would become a queen cell. So this is a terminology thing for beginning beekeepers. When does a queen cup become a queen cell? Well, it has nothing to do with the geometry of the structure that they're making in there and everything to do with whether or not there's an egg in it. So when there's a queen cup and it's empty, it's a queen cup. When they put an egg in it, now it just became a queen cell. See, because it's, it's encapsulating a egg that's going to become a larvae. In three days, it's gonna hatch, now it's larvae. And so it's actually, Nothing to do with the size of it. Early stages of development of those cups and cells. Uh, as soon as that cup gets an egg, it's a queen cell. So now that we have that settled, we have another term here, two supersedure cups. Okay, so a supersedure, the queen cups and queen cells will be on the lower edges of these frames. If it's a supersedure, which means something's wrong with the queen, we're gonna get rid of her right now. They would come up here and they would just pick one of the cells up in here and they would start to draw it out with wax and it would be much larger than the adjacent cells and once it has an egg in it instead of a it becomes a queen cell it's a cup until there's an egg in it so now we have super seizure cells that come out and they also come out make an angle and droop down along the face of your brood frame so these are all troubling things, and here's why I say Joy's in trouble. I destroyed all of them. How do you destroy a queen cell, first of all? Well, some people just smush it with their finger. They just smush them. Some people tear them out and toss them. What you've just done, because here's the other part, I noticed there was not a lot of brood. So there's no mention here of whether or not there are eggs present or whether there's open larvae. And larvae, first of all, that has to be very young. In other words, it has to be larvae that just hatched from the egg. It can't be big, fat, little Michelin men inside these cells that are filling them up. These are every cell through here has eggs and larvae in it at various stages of development. So if I got rid of their queen, they'd be good to go because as soon as that egg hatched, they would turn that into a queen cell and they would raise a replacement. In the absence of that, they have no ability to raise a replacement now. So number one, we should not take off the honey resources because we're about to see a reduction in the bee population there. And, number, and they're gonna need those resources because their forager numbers will go down. So the other thing is, uh, Joy just took away their ability to replace the queen, which I highly suspect, if there's no eggs and no young larvae. She has either made preparations to leave, in other words, she's not being fed, she's being run thin, they're chasing her around the colony, so that she loses weight so she can fly off and so that they can swarm. By the time you start to see these cups, queen cells getting capped, uh, they've already made their decision to leave. Smashing the cells took all the insurance away. So now I suspect that this colony is in jeopardy of becoming queenless because of that. So yes, you should be worried if there's a chance that she lays a couple of eggs or that there's a queen cell that you missed. Check around and see if there's another queen cell or two. 
It's very often that they make several queen cells. I've had four or five, six queen cells in the same colony at the same time. So if there's any chance there's still queen cells in there, don't smush them. I never smush my queen cells, no matter what, because um, if they're making preparations to swarm, they've already got queen cells and they're near full development, they've made a decision to get out of there. So it's a time to do a split. If you can find the queen, because she's on her way out anyway, move her into a new box with a bunch of brood. You've alleviated the pressure in there, the population. Look at the population of this place. If ever there's a colony that looks like it's ready to swarm, it's going to be this one. But what you can't see is the backside of it. It's only about 30% populated on the backside, so they still have room for expansion. But when you see a population like this midday, it's the middle of the day, it's in the 90s. Uh, these are very calm acting, so they don't look like they're making preparations for anything. Plus, there's no insurance policy in here. There's no queen cells yet. But... Uh, when you see a highly populated group like that, you see the development, queen cups being turned into queen cells, time to think about maybe doing a split. And if you've got a friend that wants a colony of bees, you can give them your old queen. It satisfies their urge to send her away. And now they'll replace her. Natural brood break, natural varroa control because the brood will be interrupted for a period of weeks. And uh, there you go. So for the benefit of those watching, teaching moment, don't smash queen cells when you find them. And the terminology difference, queen cup, empty, queen cell, has an egg or developing larvae in it. Next one, KCXX2. Hi, Mr. Dunn. You mentioned in the past how paper wasps can help protect a hive from other wasps and hornets. A small number have started to set up in a hollow, fake, scare owl next to our garden. Is there any way to encourage them to build a larger nest, i.e., would they use mason bee tubes if we set them up nearby, or is there a better solution? We understand the risk of stinging from paper wasps if they are irritated, but who in the right mind irritates bees? Exclamation point. Okay, so here's the thing. I have been doing an ongoing test involving paper wasps and paper wasps are a very specific species i'm not playing games with yellow jackets i'm not playing games with bald faced hornets because we all know i can't stand bald faced hornets but anyway i love nature i respect it bald faced hornets so gloves are off and of course my my colony of paper wasps so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a couple of uh, videos down in the in the description of this one i'm going to link them to show you number one what my paper wasp project is. Number two, how I collect, relocate, and install paper wasp nests that will help you make a positive identification on what these wasps look like. They're passive to people, they're passive to bees, but they help displace the yellow jacket. So what I've done is I've got a wasp versus wasp kind of situation where I use them to pressure out the yellow jackets because they don't tolerate them and they don't attack the bees. There you have it wasps. And I'm going to show the configuration here. And again, this is a green drawing, but this shows the differences. There was a mention of using tubes for solitary bees, and there are also solitary wasps. And the mason bees are the most common, and we have these little tube houses. And sometimes I just take a cut off what's called a biscuit from the end of a log, and I drill six inch deep holes in it of various diameters, quarter inch, eighth inch, three sixteenths, and so on. And then they get occupied by mason bees, which are solitary bees. Those uh, houses like this with these tubes will not encourage the moving in of paper wasps, which have this little tiny attachment generally under an overhang on the porch in a door frame sometimes. And then they have this little paper, this cellulose nest that comes out and has a whole bunch of hexagonal cells in it. These are social wasps, so they're very different from these solitary wasps and bees that use the tubes. And this is what I do. Now, can you encourage them to build bigger? That's really up to them and their own reproduction. They have a queen, just like the bees do. And uh, in the spring, you see the queen fly in by herself. She starts to make a nest all by herself, and that's why you'll see them on unfinished wood. And sort of like this shed that I'm in right now, it's all unfinished wood on the outside. All the neat contouring and everything has been done by fainting goats. But you'll see them in the spring, the queens will be chewing away and they're getting the cellulose 
from the wood and they're going to fly over and they're going to make their cells and then as the queens lay their eggs and those eggs turn into larvae and then they hatch the queen will remain on the nest and she continues to lay while now the larvae that are adults will fly around forage and bring in the resources necessary to continue to grow the larvae uh, unusual to see a paper nest disc bigger than about that around here so as far as encouraging them to grow more get bigger my solution to that is to just add more of the tiny paper wasp nests and I stick them in different places where they'll be protected like the porch out here, the overhangs and stuff like that. The ones that moved in here did that on their own. I would not be moving them inside, but uh, they need access to the outside. So that's it. Um, the solitary bees and wasps, the tubes and stuff, that's a totally different thing. So you're encouraging pollinators and that's why those are considered pollinator houses usually with the tubes and uh, I have the ones that came from uh, Flow Hive because it was part of a pollinator program and we're all donating money to it and stuff like that. So now moving on, Jeff Norman, Scottville, Michigan. I have some smaller splits that I'm concerned won't be in good position going into winter. Any advice for helping them along? I've kept one-to-one -one sugar water available for them. One-to-one -one sugar water is one part granulated sugar, cane sugar, dry granulated sugar, and uh, pure water mixed together and that imitates nectar for the bees so they can use it for energy and to build comb and so on. Sugar available for them and but they don't seem to care about it. Is it crazy to think about keeping them somewhere not outside so they can just be fed all winter? Thank you for all your excellent videos. Okay here's the thing. Um, I never ever want to have to keep a colony of bees that has to be kept inside, which is against, you know, their natural abilities to forage when they need to, cleansing flights and all that stuff. I want them to be hardy to handle the environment that they're in outside. I also don't want bees that have to be handheld through winter. So what I often do, this happens when late season swarms come along, as they did last year, and uh, I hive them up just to see if they can make it. I don't do anything for them. Obviously, when you first hive them up and while it's still warm outside, you put the sugar syrup on. As the season gets colder, we change the sugar content higher to a two to one instead of one to one. And we do things like that to help them along. But once winter hits, that's it. What they have, they have. If they make it, they make it and so on. So um, to my surprise, because last year we were testing better comb here, I tried that in several late season swarms and they all made it but one. So. Uh, the ability for them to store resources and it's a small swarm, small cluster. Uh, they don't have a lot that they have to get through, but they need a minimum number of bees so they can physically insulate themselves against the cold. Because as I mentioned earlier on today, I don't insulate my hives. So whatever the thickness of the wood is, the hive is composed of, that's their insulation. So what I recommend is what I showed in another video and I'll put the link down on this one. I recommend taking this small colony and combining them with one of the stronger colonies. And uh, because I have some smaller splits that I'm concerned about. Okay, so I would start to combine them with each other, maybe. And how do you combine them? Well, first I'll put a link to the video that shows you how to do that. But I also did a, a rough illustration here. And uh, so if this is a strong colony of bees that you have, and let's just say that's a 10 frame box. And this is another box you put on top of that with the weak colony that you're afraid is not going to make it. In between these two boxes, you put newsprint. In that newsprint, you put little tiny slits in it so that air passes through it from the bottom box to this next box up. Then you just put the inner cover on, you put the telescoping cover on that, you close them up, and you let these two colonies join together gradually, making a stronger single colony from weaker individual colonies. Always put the weaker one on top, strongest one on the bottom. And uh, again, I'm going to show you the link down in the video description if you want to watch how that process goes. And that's because they had two colonies that were robbed out. Both were left queenless. We combined them together. We flew in a queen from where? Bee Weaver. Put that in. She was accepted right away. And off they went in good form. And they're still doing well. So you can always take weaker colonies, hopefully well in advance of winter getting here. If you've got a colony that's just barely plugging along, or maybe they've lost a queen, you don't want to bring in a queen. They'll just continue to lose their numbers in the absence of a queen and the ability to replace her. So 
you can take that one and combine them with another intermediate colony, one that's not so strong, that could use the numbers of the bees, that way you're not losing the bees, and you freed up a space when uh, someday you get more bees that are healthy and strong and ready to go. Next question, Tariq Bat from Kashmir in India. I have been uh, keeping some colonies for quite some time and I have noticed I have two colonies that has bees mixed. I mean, just like your swarm has two colored bees. Mine are also two colored. Some are all black, striped. Some have few stripes, sort of orange, colored, exact as the swarm has. I just want to know what genetics they have. Now this does happen a lot because um, bees are not all of the same identical genetic line, even within the same colony. What do you mean? Well, because the queen bee, let's go back to her biology. When a queen bee is developed through one of those queen cells that we talked about earlier, when she hatches out, she's a virgin queen. She's not been mated. So she has the genetics of her mother, right? And she has the genetics not just of her mother, the queen in that colony, but her father, which is one of the many drones that her mother mated with. So now we have mixed genetics because up to, and this again comes from the science that's done by people that are actually tracking genetics of the drones. How many drones did the queen mate with? Up to 20. How do they know that? Well, because when the mated queen comes back and they smash her and they look in her spermatheca, which is where she stores all the sperm from all the drones. Now, you know what? I'm going to sidetrack a little bit. Queens are unnecessarily promiscuous when they do these mating flights. Why? Because they literally get millions of sperm from the drones when they mate and they have all the resources they need to lay for the rest of their life from up to five drones. But then they go on and they keep mating with six drones, seven drones, eight, nine, ten. They keep mating. They're in a frenzy at the drone congregation area. They're just running amok and they mate with 20 different drones and then they fly home with the remnants of the last drone they mated with, known as the mating sign. Still stuck. And every drone, people say, how do you know whether the drones made it or not when they're coming back to your hive? Oh, trust me, when they made it with the queen, they died. They discharged their reproductive organs right into the queen. They detached, they died with tiny smiles on their face. And then the queen comes back having killed 20 people, sorry, having murdered, having killed, having disposed of 20 drones all so that she could reproduce, be fertile, lay eggs forever. Because after those mating flights, that queen just lays eggs forever. Millions of bees she can generate. So here's the thing. This is why we have different colored workers within the hive. You've got little uh, leather colored bees, and then we've got the really dark ones, and they're all cohabitating. Those are sisters, and then we have half sisters. So this is very interesting too, because there's a dynamic within the hive where full sisters, those that have the same drone, and of course they're all from the same queen, they tend to function together. They tend to part themselves together inside the colony and uh, they do mix with one another, but they prefer the 100% genetic line that they are connected with. Very interesting stuff. So the rest of them are half sisters so they can have variables in what they look like. Now, sometimes one thing that should not look any different than anybody else is the drones that are coming out of that colony. That's why we know we have freeloader drones. When I'm looking at a colony and they're all dark and uh, the drones have all come from that queen, then you'll see a golden drone come out and you'll see another one. Then you'll see five or six of them. Well, they didn't come from that queen. What are they doing? They're freeloaders. They just flew in. They parked there. For some reason, drones are accepted by colonies they do not belong to. And they're just free letters. They come in there and they're hitting everybody up for food and resources. And then later they fly out. So you see the different colors. So those are from different colonies, actually. Another curious thing is some people refer to the dark colored bees as cold weather bees, northern bees, black bees. Uh, Russians come to mind. They're black bees. And then the lighter colored bees, the yellow bees, the golden bees are more southern warm climate bees. So there's a broad generality drawn from the fact that they are light colored, southern and warm, dark bees, northern and cold. 
So that's what's going on. They're, they're sister bees from the same colony if they're workers living there because workers do drift, they can drift from one colony to another, again, but instead of begging resources from that colony, if they come in empty handed, they get rejected by that colony because they're genetically not connected. But if they come in loaded with pollen and resources, they get accepted, that's called bee drift. They land on the wrong landing board, they move in. And so you can see some bees that are different that did not come from that colony, but we have sister colonies, sister bees inside the same colony uh, with up to 20 different fathers. So there we have that, the promiscuous virgin queen randomly selecting males to breed with in the drone congregation area, who knows where, all by herself, unattended, unsupervised. Next question comes from Mary Bond. This is from the UK. I'm a beekeeper in the UK. I would like to get a long Langstroth hive made for my bees. Have you produced any plans? They look amazing. Thank you. And just what I need. I have a bad back, but don't want to give up my beekeeping. I haven't seen anything similar in the UK. Thanks so much for your informative post. Okay, so here's the thing. This is a very, Mary's asking a question that I get all the time. Fred, how's your horizontal hive doing? How's Long Lang doing? Well, we're gonna update that, first of all. Here's why I don't make drawings right now. I may still modify the hive. I may make changes. I don't want to put out a drawing and have a bunch of people take the drawing and go make their own colleges and say, man, how did you come up with that? Why didn't you see that problem coming? I want to get them through a full at least year and then see how the bees did or did not do. I may abandon the horizontal hive project altogether or I may make modifications. Once I've made all my modifications and changes and tweaked little things here and there, what worked, what didn't, I will make technical drawings and they will be available on my website, fredsfinecall.com. And uh, you can just have them. So once they're done and out there, we will put them out. But I'm not going to be doing that until next year. Let's say you want drawings right now. You want to do something right now. Oh, good. Thank you for that question. First of all, if we're thinking about horizontal hives at all, you can go to a website called horizontalhives.com. But I want to talk to you about this book, Beekeeping with a Smile. And this is Fedor Luzitin, is the author with Leo Sherishkin. Dr. Leo, Fedor, by the way, passed away, sadly. But uh, this is a new revised second edition of Keeping Bees with a Smile. Principles and Practices of Natural Beekeeping. If you want the most hands-off beekeeping, Dr. Leo is a proponent of two inspections a year. And uh, of course, horizontal hive structure. Now here's what's good and why I wanted to show you this book. They spec out all the materials and everything that you're gonna need to build a hive and technical drawings. They have the specs, the cuts you need to make. So it sounds like uh, Mary is wanting to have somebody construct a hive. Uh, my drawings that I'm going to make are just going to be drawings. I am not going to explain in it step by step how to build a horizontal hive, although I may, once I arrive at my final design, I may make a video showing step by step. Some people are very frustrated that when I put my horizontal hive together, I didn't make a video showing step by step how I did it, how I did the joints, how I made it, how I measured it, what my logic was. Uh, that's because, again, it's a prototype. It's just in service. And by the way, a lot of people make them already. So it's not like some, it's not a, you know, a dynamic new, you know, way of approaching beekeeping. I'm just assigning my principles and understanding of honeybee biology to the best I can to this horizontal format, which, by the way, I still favor the vertical format, but I completely understand that the horizontal hive makes beekeeping accessible to those who can't lift things. Also, people in wheelchairs, people who are elderly, people who have, um, you know, problems with their hands and they, they don't have wrist strength and things like that. Because the only thing that you have to lift in that hive is the cover, which can have a hydraulic assist on it if you wanted that. And then after that, you're pulling the inner boards up, which are very easy to pull. Mine aren't even gluing them down, which is really funny. And uh, then you're just pulling individual frames. So it is, and not only that, you set it up 
the height of this table. I could be in a wheelchair right here and could have opened this up and this can be my horizontal hive. By the way, the bees are doing extremely well and as I said, I'm gonna do a follow-up video on them and show you what's going on. That is the most convenient beekeeping method I have ever seen. You can make your hive as heavy and as thick as you want it to be because you're not moving it around, you're not lifting it, and it's a great way to go. I know I just said a lot for a very small question. I don't have plans yet. I will in the future, they'll be free. Next, Andrew Wallbridge, Jefferson, Ohio. Hello, I've been looking at starting backyard beekeeping for a while now and had a few questions. Firstly, how would bees react to chickens and or cats around their hive or on it? We have a decent number of curious chickens and cats. I wouldn't want them getting swarmed. Secondly, how do you mow or trim around the beehive? Would you have to wear a bee suit or would the bees even care? And thirdly, what kind of things would be good to offer bees as supplemental food in winter? All right, well, I can answer the cat thing right away and the chickens because freerangechickens.org, that's me. Oh, by the way, if you want to buy a DVD about chickens, look up Regarding Chickens, Essentials for the Flock Owner. I published that back in 2006. It's a three-hour video guide. I had to plug it. But we've always had chickens and stuff around the bees, cats too. And just as described here, a cat will climb up right on top of a beehive and lay there with bees coming and going. Now, I think it would make a difference whether that was a really long-haired cat or a short-haired cat. We had a cat named Winter. She had really long hair, and uh, she did not hang out on the beehives, although she walked right through the bee yard without a thought. The chickens walk right in front of the landing boards, right next to the beehives, peck around under the beehives. They clip off grass. They eat bugs everywhere they go. We have free-ranging chickens here, and... Uh, the bees don't mind them one bit at all. If you've got highly defensive bees, you'll know it, and that's when you need to make a change. I would work exclusively with very passive, easygoing honeybees if I had free-ranging chickens and cats that felt like they just had to climb up on those beehives and lay there. Beehives are warm, so on a really cold day, you know, and the cat's outside and it's nice and clear, and by really cold, I, I don't mean winter time, but the cats will go out and just sit on top of them, just like cats that lay on top of goats, lay on top of your sheep and then you see this little wool mat packed down on the sheep because some cat likes that particular sheep and she lays on it all the time and pads her little feet and mashes down all the anyway we're off the subject here chickens cats all fine around bees if you have a white cat all the better colors matter if your cats have long hair and it's a black cat a really dark colored cat your bees would probably respond differently than if it were a calico cat Calicos are all female, by the way, in case you didn't know. But uh, yeah, they handle that. Everything is fine. The third part here is what kind of things would be good to offer the bees as supplemental food in winter. Last year, we did emergency feeding of the bees because they went through everything so quickly because it was a mild winter. And so therefore, the bees were animated and active more. I think in the South, they deal with that a lot more than we do. I would look up something called Pro Sweet. Pro Sweet by Man Lake. It is close to being actual honey. You can put that in a feeder, it will not freeze, and it will provide the, the bees with maximum sugar energy, carbohydrates, so they can vibrate their flight muscles without fanning their wings, and they can uh, keep everybody warm around them. So that's a good thing. Dry sugar on top, and uh, some people like to open up their hives and put it directly on the brood boxes and stuff like that. I'm not one of the people that's done that. I always put it, I have a feeder shim, let me make a note here. Look up my feeder shim video. There'll be a link down in the video description here. And you can see how I've configured that because that lets you provide dry or liquid syrup to your bees, summer or winter. And uh, even though we put vents in them, the bees have closed up all the vents. The bees wanted no venting through the top. So that allows you to open your beehives even in the dead of winter without exposing the brood in lower areas to a draft or cold air that could ultimately put the final tack in your coffin on your bees if they're struggling and barely making it, which is why you're feeding them anyway. And let's go back to the very beginning too, where you want to make sure to leave enough honey supers on uh, to get your bees through winter because that honey in spring is still good if it's left over. If there's a lot of surplus, you can collect that and feed it back to your bees later or you can keep it for yourself. So 
Leaving too much on through winter does not hurt. We're backyard beekeepers, we're not commercial beekeepers. We don't have to get every cent out of our bees that we can. So it doesn't hurt us to leave a bunch of honey on your bees through winter. Uh, now that doesn't mean, let me backpedal a little bit, because the bees need to use the resources that are there. I mean, if you've got a cluster of bees this size, and you've already got a medium above them and another medium above that of honey, don't go four or five or six mediums of honey because Fred said, the more the merrier kind of thing. That's not the case because what's gonna happen is if they don't migrate all the way up there, they're heating the area immediate around their cluster. So the bees are insulating the bees in winter. There is some warm air that goes off and where does it go? It rises. So if there's a whole bunch of honey resources way above them and the bees have not migrated up there, according to Dr. Shereskin, they move up as a cluster one millimeter per day. So if you've got, you know, five months, six months of, of time that they have to go up through there, then uh, you just count out the millimeters and centimeters and figure out how much space above you need. Don't provide a huge vacuous space of stored capped honey. By the way, capped honey, if condensation lands on it and moisture builds on it really heavy, uh, capped honey can actually sour, it can actually spoil. If there aren't enough bees to work with it and keep it, keep the climate under control there, uh, some moisture can actually leach in. That's why sometimes you find an abandoned colony, a dead out or something like that, and the honey frames are all capped and everything, but they, they smell kind of uh, sour. That's because they still manage to take on water. So we don't want, you know, the too much surplus. 50 to 100 pounds, you're good to go. I wouldn't go much beyond that. And now here we go, Tyler Edwards. I live in Southwest Ohio. Do I need to spend the extra money on a seven frame flow hive so my bees have that extra space for the winter? All these winter questions, it's good to be asking them this time of year, by the way. Or is a six frame sufficient? So for those of you who are not familiar, Flow hives, we get a lot of questions about those, and that's because I've done extensive testing on flow hives, and I have a playlist on my YouTube channel called My Flow Hive Experience, and you can click on that and see through the years how we evaluated and modified it and used the flow hive. So the question is, when you're a seven frame flow hive, people go, what's that? There's no seven frame beehive. Well, that matches the Langstroth eight frame. So a seven frame, or 10 frame, I'm sorry. So a seven frame flow super, it's seven of those thick uh, frames that are used to draw the honey off. So they're the mechanized frames that separate honey drains out. That's what you're using for your flow super above those bottom two boxes. Okay, so if it's a seven frame flow hive, that's a 10 frame Langstroth base matchup. If it's the six frame flow hive, that's the eight frame base standard flow hive or standard Langstroth hive size. And that's because it's compatible with standard Langstroth equipment. So do you need to spend the money? Okay, first of all, we all know that flow hives are very expensive. I'm gonna give you a link down there to save you $50 if you wanna get one yourself. That'll be in the video description. But here's the thing, uh, when the state bee inspector comes around, I always ask him questions about who's making it through winter. What kind of colonies are surviving and what are they in? And you know, the eight frame hive configurations are making it just as well as the 10 frame hive configurations here in the Northeastern United States, where we get pretty heavy winters. So do you really need the 10 frame extra, you know, cause that's two extra frames. Do you really need it? I would say based on what the bees do with the space they have, you don't need it. You could actually use an eight frame. You could do an eight frame hive. Because in the spring, nine times out of 10, you know, the nectar flow hasn't hit us yet. This is all gonna fill with honey all the way down to about here. This is all gonna be the brood. But here's the thing, when you have a 10 frame box, and so let's take the eight middle frames and the number one frame and the number 10 frame out here, inevitably those outer frames are still full of capped honey because what did the cluster do? They moved up. They only occupied the center five or six frames. They abandoned the resources laterally and they just went up through the hive. So I would say what matters more than the width of it, eight or 10 frame is the height of it. So if you were going to do an eight frame, 
run a couple of medium supers over the top of that. And I think you're good to go before you put your flow super on. One of the things I wish the flow hive people would make, if anybody from flow is watching this, we want medium supers made by flow that match the flow hives exactly. Because when you do stack those boxes, the flow hives against the standard Langstroth, the flow hives are generally, they're, you know, an eighth of an inch narrower. They're the same length front to back, but width wise, they're narrower. And that's why you can't take a flow hive roof and put it on a standard Langstroth super. Because now the roof is too small because it's configured for that flow hive design. So no, you do not need the seven frame, 10 frame Lang. You can make it with the six, especially considering you're in Southwest Ohio. I think you're in much better situation there than I am here. So that was the last question of the day. Thank you for watching. And I want you all to have a fantastic weekend. If you have questions, don't forget to write your questions down below in the comment section or follow the link to my website and you can fill out a form to submit your question or you can go to the Facebook page. So what else we're we going to talk about? Upcoming, the long lang update video that I talked about, flow hive supering, when to do that and how to do it without a queen excluder so you get quicker build up there in high heat conditions and the readings of the temperatures on the hives on high heat days. I'm taking advantage of the fact that things are super hot here. And a honeybee watering preferences, what the bees do, how they manage water, foraging, everything else, and things to add to your water. I'll tell you ahead of time, for those of you who are still hanging around, one teaspoon of sea salts per quart of fresh water. Bees like that, what kind of sea salt? You could use Himalayan salts or you could use Morton sea salts. Mix it up. Put it right out there the bees go for it and they really want that the other thing is uh, we're putting out calcium and magnesium which is so does cal mag we put that out one teaspoon per quart of cal mag which is designed for human consumption free choice the bees are taking that more frequently than they are the salt water and also always have fresh water out for your bees the other thing we've noticed is I thought it would be cool to put the drinkers in the shade. If you have drinkers in the shade and you have drinkers for the bees in the sun, they prefer those that are in the sun nine times out of 10. Even though I thought for a moment there that those bees are in jeopardy, that the sunlight was speeding down on those open feeders and then the water was getting so hot that if a bee fell in it, it would be cooked. The bees are showing a disproportionate preference. For drinkers that are out in open sun, they naturally avoid the shaded drinkers. And since the drinkers were plastic, I thought, let's keep them out of the ultraviolet rays, put them in the shade, total fail. Birds like drinkers in the shade. Bees like water that's offered in the sunshine, who knew? So now we have to leave the water running in those open drinkers just enough because it's well water, nice and cold, 55 degrees coming out there just gradually dripping and cascading to the different pans. It keeps it cool enough and the bees prefer it. Oh, and the other thing is masks, if you're still here. We just got these in. These are, in my state, everybody in the state has to wear a face mask. These are the way to be face masks and I designed them. This is of course my logo. And I put them on Teespring and I've had to wear masks for everything I do. I'm a photographer. And over the last weekend, I was in the uh, eastern part of the state. So we have different designs here. These have uh, cotton liners. They have to be hand washed. But what I like about them the most is you can breathe through these super easy. And these are coming through my Teespring account. So those who are asking always, hey, Fred, how can we contribute to you? How can we donate? Things like that. I would love it if instead of just donating money, and thank you to those of you who do that, by the way, it's very generous and I do appreciate it. I would love it if you got something for your money. Plus this tells everybody that you're interested in bees, that this is the way to be, and uh, these breathe easy. So if you do not like a lot of restriction on your face when you're breathing, these are made in the United States. You have to hand wash them, they have elastics on them. But uh, these are very popular right now. I would much rather that you bought something that you needed and that you could benefit from instead of uh, 
just giving me money with nothing to show for it. So thank you for watching. Have a fantastic weekend and stay safe wherever you are. I hope you're avoiding COVID-19. I'm here in the bee yard, totally safe. Thanks again. Have a great weekend.